Well, good morning all, and welcome to this morning's service of worship. Here's a quick unplanned <coughs> response. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will indeed. We'd like to stand. We're going to sing together. Splendor and majesty, strength and beauty be unto your name, ancient of days, your holy.
from August were shorter. So he said, can I be shorter than him? I said, well, of course I am. He's six foot something, I'm only five foot nine. Uh, to him, if you were here last week, I said, I, I'm just like a grasshopper. So here I am. And so I'm here to speak a message, a message of love. And, and so it's easy, really, because I'm just following in St. Paul's footsteps. And he came to bring a message of love. And he spoke simply and clearly, and I hope that's what I'm going to do this morning. And so I'm going to speak a message of love. So what do I love? Well, I could speak about HP Source, and I have. I've already spoken about HP Source, you remember. Uh, I could speak about squirty cream that I have on my coffee, or Cornish pasties that I really love, but aren't good for me anymore. Or I could speak about Jill's home-baked cakes for the entire service, because I really love those, and some of you have sampled them as well. So it's easy to speak about the things that you love, isn't it? Well, recently I had a birthday, and um, I got cards from family and friends, and I brought one or two. And I, just this is just a small selection. I got many more than these. And it's great when you get cards, isn't it? I mean, St. Paul sent letters. Most of the New Testament is letters from St. Paul. But nobody sends letters anymore. You can't afford the stamps, can you? But I got lovely cards. And, and it's great when you get them and you, you look at them and it says, to my brilliant brother, you know, awesome, amazing, fantastic, terrific, and incredible. And he's describing himself, my, my brother. You know, and I, I don't like to open them because, you know. So, amazing granddad. Isn't that good? And then... Um, so somebody uh, here will be blushing in a minute, wishing you a classic birthday. I'm not looking at you. Uh, <laughs> to a classic man. See, they're talking about my car, really, not me. Dad, you're a superhero. How about that, yeah? Granddad, know what's really brilliant about you? I'm not opening it. <laughs> Older, wiser, wrinklier. <laughs> and for my husband, <laughs> with tons of love on your birthday, she'll, she'll change this when I finish the sermon. You see, it's great looking on the front, but when you open the inside, it's not so good sometimes. You know, that, this one from my brother, it, all this is describing who he is, awesome, amazing, fantastic and everything. And when you look inside, it's quite insulting, really. <laughs> and it's the same with St. Paul's letters sometimes. He starts off saying, I pray for you. I love you. You are wonderful people. But when you really open the letter up and you get to see what he's really saying, it's not that good. And when he wrote the letters that we have, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, it starts off really well. But then he gets to the nitty gritty of it and he's saying, you know, you're not doing as well as you were when I started your church and something's gone wrong. And you've got to be really careful because if you're not careful, you're going uh, away from God. And the Corinthians, they were a fabulous church. I mean, he started off saying, oh, you're doing really well. And, and he was speaking to them in love. I mean, when he started the church at Corinth, he spoke simply and plainly about Christ. He said, I'm not going to get into theological discussions with you. I'm not going to go ranting and raving about things that you might not understand. You know, he, he could have done, but he didn't. He just said, I'm going to speak simply. I mean, 
Corinthians. It, it was a great church, but Corinth wasn't a great place. It, it was full of all sorts. There were all sorts of things going on. Uh, and it, it, it was, they, were, they were starting to drift off. And so he spoke to them plainly and simply about Christ crucified in a way that they could clearly understand. He gave his testimony to them. I mean, we remember about St. Paul. He was Saul of Tarsus and he was on his way to persecute the Christians. He didn't like them. They were going against what he believed. And he had a letter in his pocket to say that he could get rid of this lot. He could destroy them. And on the way, of course, he was blinded on the Damascus Road. And his eyes were opened by a man called Ananias. And God said to Ananias, go to Saul and open his eyes. And Ananias said, well, he's a bit dodgy, this guy. He, he wants to persecute the Christians. We've got to be very careful. And Jesus said to Ananias, I've chosen him to make my name known by speaking my name to Gentiles and kings and Jews, and I will show him all that he must suffer for my name. So he was calling Saul to speak his name, and because he was going to speak his name, he was going to suffer for it. So Paul's testimony was how he was blinded, but now he could see because of Jesus. He wasn't the first blind man to say that, by the way. You remember in the New Testament the story that Jesus healed the blind man, and then the Pharisees were really upset about that, and they wanted to know how this blind man had been healed, and they called people and said, who is this man and what's happened to him? And eventually they called the blind man and said, what's happened? And he said, well, I don't know. I was blind, and now I can see. And that was his testimony. And I don't know who this Jesus is, but all I know is he came and he touched my eyes and he healed me and now I can see. And that's his testimony. And you can't argue with that, can you? And when you tell your story about what Jesus has done for you, nobody can argue with that. And that's what we're all called to do, to tell our simple story in an easy way. And people can't argue with it. And so, Paul simply spoke of Christ and how he was saved by the crucifixion and resurrection, and he'd been forgiven all his sins, and he had the promise of eternal life, and he said, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. And so the church at Corinth grew under his simple gospel teaching. But he'd been away from them, he'd gone to other places, and they'd become divided, and the church had, had got a bit lost. And some had decided to follow, for, follow Paul, some followed Apollos, some followed Cephas, some followed Christ. And the good news had become confused and legalized and misinterpreted and misunderstood. And the church was in danger of splitting up. And so Paul wrote to them to try and sort things out. I mean, at the time that he wrote this, he was based in Ephesus, and he'd been there for some time. And it seemed like he'd had a few problems in Ephesus, trying to sort the church out there. I mean, it was in Ephesians, we find him saying things like, wives, obey your husbands. You can see why he had a few problems. And he said, Children, obey your parents. There's problems with that as well. And he said something else. I can't remember what else he said. Something about husbands. I can't remember what that was. I can't remember what that was. But you see, it, it's difficult, isn't it, with this obeying thing? 
I mean, children, obey your parents. How many of you have got children? Do they obey you? Do they? I mean, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, I found a quote here about children. It says, children today are tyrants. They contradict their parents, they gobble their food, and they tyrannize their teachers. It's true, isn't it? That was written by Socrates in the year 425 B.C. <laughs> Times haven't changed at all, have they? Wives, obey your husbands. That's a difficult one, isn't it? It's not difficult for me. It's impossible. <laughs> you see, I find sometimes that my wife doesn't take any notice of me. And, and I, thought, I thought it was down that, that she couldn't hear me properly. I thought she was going deaf. And I, I said to, I, I, I was at the doctor's and I said, I think my wife's going deaf. And he said, well, you can test that. He said, what you want to do is to say something to her and see if she responds. He said, do it from a distance. So ask her a question and then see if she responds. And if she doesn't, go a bit nearer and, and see how near you have to get before she responds. So I thought, I'll try this. So... One day she was making our dinner in the kitchen and I was sat in the lounge on the settee. It was unusual because usually I'm very busy. <laughs> so I'm sat in the lounge on the settee and she's in the kitchen making the dinner. So I shouted to her from the lounge, what are we having for dinner, darling? <laughs> no response at all, I thought. She's deaf. So he said to me, if she doesn't get a response, move a bit closer. So I went to the door of the lounge and I shouted, what are we having for dinner, darling? No response. So I went uh, into the hallway and I tried again. What are we having for dinner, darling? No response. I thought, she's definitely deaf. So I went to the kitchen door. What are we having for dinner, darling? No response. So I stood right behind her in the kitchen. What are we having for dinner, darling? She turned round and she said, for the fifth time, chicken. <laughs> I've now got two hearing aids. But I have to say that she did obey me for a, nearly a week recently. One week. Whatever I said, she obeyed. I could say this, say that, whatever it was. And then she came home from Portugal. <laughs> I know my place. <laughs> it's Jill first, then the dog then the chickens, and me in the garage. <laughs> well, I don't mind being in the garage because it's a lovely place now because when she was in Portugal, I tidied the garage out. I've been trying to do that for years and I managed it while she was away in Portugal. She'd gone to Portugal for a, a few days with her daughter and her granddaughter. It was a girly trip. You know, and I was left at home, bread and water. So I tidied the garage out, but all the time she was away, she obeyed me in my head. And um, I was talking about this obedience thing, and uh, I was talking to Margaret and Trevor about obeying. I said to, to Trevor, does your wife obey you? <laughs> but she was with him, unfortunately. So, <laughs> yeah, To be honest, and I asked her if she would write a, uh, a poem about wives obeying husbands. She didn't. 
But she did write a poem about obedience, and I'm just going to read it to you. Obedience to God on crucifixion day, for all of our sins the price Jesus did pay. Obedience to God and all his commands, respect and our love and belief he demands. But it's not a demand as his arms open wide. He longs to embrace for us to be by his side. This obedient respect we must show one another. Be caring and kind as we love each other. With him there is peace and his love he enfolds. His compassion and gentleness more precious than gold. If we obey his teaching through his holy word, rest in his presence as his love is shared, we can know pure joy that obedience can bring. His love and compassion can make our heart sing. Isn't that good? You see, obedience is really about relationships. When he said, when St. Paul wrote, wives obey husbands, husbands love your wives, children obey your parents. It's all about relationships. It's about loving one another, about getting on with one another. It's about caring and kindness and respect. Love one another as I have loved you. And it's respect to God because of all that Jesus has won for us. So there's nothing wrong with St. Paul writing about us obeying and loving one another. So while Jill was in Portugal, I really missed her so much. It was a, a lonely time for me. I mean, we did text and we WhatsApped and we FaceTimed and we rang each other, but it wasn't like being with her. It wasn't the same. I mean, the home was just a house. It felt empty. And I could speak about Jill and, and my love for her for the rest of this morning. I don't need a theology degree or three years at college to do a course on love. I could speak about it all morning. This is great. And St. Paul said, I just speak Jesus and him crucified. Paul was well educated. He was the best of the best Pharisee. But he counted all his knowledge and all his upbringing complete rubbish compared to knowing Jesus who died for him. He just wanted to speak the name of Jesus, to tell his story of forgiveness, about how much Jesus loved him, how he'd forgiven his sins, how he'd given him salvation and eternal life because of the grace of a loving Savior. This simple gospel to all who receive it. And he wants us to do that now, to speak the name of Jesus, to tell our story. Do you know, it's, it's not always easy though, is it? To speak out and tell your story. Sometimes it can be challenging. It can be challenging to, to speak out to others. Sometimes you do hear the word of Jesus, but it's not in a nice way, is it? I was in a cafe once quite a while ago. I was actually wearing my dog collar because I was still a Methodist minister then and I was kind of working, but I'd gone to chill out and have a coffee in a cafe and I was sat there and there was, I couldn't chill out because there was all this raucous laughter going on nearby. And there was a group of people and they were having a good time. But I kept hearing this, oh my God, oh my God, and Jesus, Jesus, and I thought, this is terrible. You know, this is not what it's meant to be at all. And I, I couldn't kind of rest easy and I couldn't chill out. And eventually I went over. And there was this group of young people and, and there were these women and men. And I, I went to one of them and there was a woman there and, and she had a lovely necklace with a cross on it. And I said, excuse me, which church do you go to? And she said, what? 
I said, well, I said, I keep here, like, speaking out God and Jesus, and I thought well, it must be a church meeting or something that I've come to. I said, I just wondered which church you went to, because obviously I'm interested as a Methodist minister. No, we don't go to any church. And I, and I got into a really interesting conversation. <laughs> but they, they'd realised what we were doing when we were shouting it, and they said, like, really sorry, like, but... And uh, it was a bit difficult. And sometimes it's not easy to be a Christian and to witness. But it wasn't easy for the first disciples either. So don't be put off by it. I was looking up what happened to the disciples. And, you know, there was only John of the disciples that lived to old age and died of old age. The others, um, they, they had some terrible things happened to them. Uh, they were martyred, they were crucified, or stabbed to death, or stoned, or suffocated. At the time that Paul St. Wrote, uh, St. Paul wrote Corinthians, uh, Nero was in charge of Rome. He was the governor of Rome. And Nero, he used to have barbecues regularly, you know, uh, and celebrate with barbecues. And he used to wrap Christians up in peat, and he would set fire to them so he could light up the area where he was having his barbecues so he could see what was going on. And he used to pour boiling oil down the backs of the necks and down the backs of Christians and set fire to it. But they would still speak out the name of Jesus. St. Paul described his own situation in 2 Corinthians 4. I just want to read 2 Corinthians 4 to you. Just, just let me read this for you. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed and broken. We are perplexed, but we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and we keep going. Through suffering, these bodies of ours constantly share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be obvious in our dying bodies, so we live in the face of death. But it has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God and so I speak. We know that the same God who raised our Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to him along with you. All of these things are for your benefit and as God's grace brings more and more people to Christ, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. And that's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day, for our present troubles are quite small, and they won't last very long, yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. So, we don't look at our troubles we can see right now. Rather, we look forward to what we have not yet seen, for the troubles we see will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. For we know now that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, when we die and we leave these bodies, we will have a home in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. Isn't that great? That's why Paul was not afraid to speak out simply the gospel of Jesus. He said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. He was looking forward to heaven. Are you looking forward to heaven? Do you know what it's like to get into heaven? Do you know how to get into heaven? Sometimes I can't sleep in the morning. I wake up very early. And what I do, I put the radio on and I listen to Premier Radio, Premier Christian Radio. 
And uh, from four o'clock in the morning, there's, there's little talks. And one of them is uh, David Jeremiah. And he's on at six o'clock in the morning. And I was listening to him one morning. He was describing what it's like to get into heaven. And um, I heard him say this. He said, um, there was a couple, Elsie and Jack, and they were a, a, an older couple. They'd been married quite a long time. And unfortunately, Elsie became very ill, and after a while, she passed away. And she got to heaven, and she met uh, St. Peter at the gate, and he said, hello, Elsie, it's good to see you. And she said, hiya, Peter. He said, would you like to come in? She said, I'd love to. He said, well, there's just one little thing that you have to do so that I get an idea of what your life was like on earth. He said, you've just got to spell one little word and you can come in. She said, okay, what's the word? He said, it's love. She said, well, that's easy. It's L-O-V-E. Well, that's great, Elsie. Come on in. So she went in. And often she would just sit at the gate and she'd watch Peter as people arrived and they'd spell this little word, L-O-V-E, and they'd come in. And then one day Peter said to her, you've been here for 10 years now, Elsie, and you've watched what I do. I've got something else on today. Would you like to look after the gate for me? And when people arrive, you know what to do. She said, I'd love to. So she stood there. And guess what? Jack arrives at the gate. Jack, she said, how lovely to see you. Where have you been all these years? What have you been doing? He said, oh, Elsie, he said, it's good to see you. He said, well, he said, do you remember when you were really ill? And that lovely blonde lady, that carer, came regularly to our house to look after you. Well, when you've gone, I asked her to come and live with me. And we got together. Oh, and it was lovely. It was great us being together. We had a great time. He said, and do you know, he said, I, I had a lovely win on the lottery. I won millions. So I sold that little old house of ours. I never did like it much. And we went to live in a big mansion in the countryside. And we got a big car. And we went on holidays abroad together. And we, we went on cruises and I bought a yacht. Oh, he said, it was great. It's been the best 10 years of my life. It's been fabulous. He said, but anyway, I'm here now with you. He said, are you going to let me in? She said, it's not that easy, you know. We've got to do a spelling test. And I know what your spelling's like. He said, oh, heck. He said, what, what have I to do? He said, just one word. If you spell that, you're in. Oh, he said, what's the word? She said, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to get into heaven. But God said, he so loved the world that he sent his son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have life everlasting. And on a serious note, I want to say, I remember Andy speaking a couple of weeks ago, and he said that he took his son to a healing service, and it didn't work out how he wanted and there was disappointment and there were questions about God and why has this happened and disappointment and hurt and I worked in a hospice for 15 years and I sat with people who were terminally ill and talked with relatives who were hurting and saying, is there a God? And why is this God doing this? And lack of understanding. And we tried to thrash these things out. 
And I sat with people and held their hands and prayed with them as they passed from this world to the next. And I want to tell you, in that 15 years, I must have held the hands of over 100 people, well over that. And I experienced, I was privileged to experience the passing of many, many people whose faith was strong, who were given a strength that I can hardly describe as they passed through this world, who found a peace and a courage and died good deaths. I prayed with people for healing, but they all passed away. But I didn't see it as a failure. And I felt that the hospice was a place of resurrection where people were allowed to die peacefully and well when it was their time. But it wasn't always the same for relatives. I experienced it myself when my wife, tomorrow would be my 52nd wedding anniversary to my first wife. But 20 years ago, I held her hand and prayed the Lord's Prayer as she went off to be with her Lord and Savior. And she was given that strength too, to do that. But I then joined the other relatives who were asking the questions, why has this happened? Is there a loving God? And you know, you can get into a situation where you don't understand and it hurts, and there's disappointment, and there's anger, and there's frustration, and there are questions that you can't answer. Some of you have been through that, and are still going through that. And someone said to me, you know, you can either get better, or you can get bitter. And it's so difficult. But there can be a time of healing. If you just allow Jesus to be with you, and he never leaves you. He is always there. And he wants to, to be with you, to heal you. You won't always understand, but he is always there. And you know, it can affect your faith. There was one man whose son had cancer and he was terminal and he was dying. And I said to him, how is this affecting your faith? Do you want to give up? And he said to me, are you kidding? He said, why would I want to give up now? He said, now more than ever, I have commended my son into God's loving care. And one day, I am going to meet with him again. Now more than ever, I want to be with Jesus. You remember in John 6, Jesus is teaching quite difficult things and he's saying, this is my body. Unless you eat of my flesh and you drink of my blood, you cannot be my disciple. And some of them were leaving him and saying, this is too hard for us. And he turned to his disciples and he said, what about you? Are you going to leave me too? And Peter said, why would we? Where would we go now that we know that you are the Messiah? You are the Son of God who has come into the world to give us eternal life. Friends, Jesus is our Savior. He is always with us. And we have that promise that one day we will be united and we will be with him in heaven. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. We can call his name when we are in trouble. And he will give us his strength in our weakness. 
And we are called to speak that loving name of Jesus, to go and make disciples, to find the lost. And all of our church activities here are based to give opportunity to share our simple gospel. The food bank, the children and youth, salt, the charity shop, and all the other things here are all to give us opportunity to speak the name of Jesus to the lost. Brian, a few weeks ago, gave a wonderful uh, talk about the lost sheep. And he said that he would leave the 99 to go and find the one. And that when it came back, there would be great rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who was saved. That it would be party time. I love a party, don't you? Parties are great. My birthday was a great party. I had friends and family around, you know. I had uh, relatives, husbands and wives and children all obeying one another and rejoicing at my party. All sharing love. And it was like a foretaste of heaven for me on my birthday. And uh, I can't wait for heaven well, I can because I'm having a great time here. I mean, I've got my young blonde lady, Kara. <laughs> She's great, and we're having a good time. We live in a lovely house in Clayton Lee Woods, and we go on lovely holidays abroad, and we've been on a cruise, and it's fabulous, you know. And it, it's like I'm living a life in abundance. I had to mention that, didn't I? Because it really is good. And I, I'm not in any hurry to go, but when I do go, I'm not afraid. In fact, I've had a word with my friendly funeral director, and I've made plans for when I do go. And um, I've ordered a bespoke coffin, and it's shaped and painted to look like a bottle of HP sauce. <laughs> and inside, I've asked to have a large Cornish pasty wrapped in foil <laughs> so that when I arrive at my destination, I can eat it. And if it's hot, I'll know that there's been a mistake and I've gone to the wrong place. <laughs> and I've donated my ashes to the England cricket team. <laughs> so they never need to worry about Australia anymore. <laughs> and I've written my address. Do you want me to read it to you? It's very short. My address is St. Peter's Gate, Heaven's Place, Cloud Nine. And I'm having a tattoo on, on my hand. And it's just one word, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> <laughs> and that will be a party I don't want to miss. A time of rejoicing over one sinner who was saved by the grace and mercy of Jesus, because somebody spoke the name of Jesus over me. Do you know, it's not difficult to demonstrate and share the love of Jesus. I, I want to finish, really, in a minute. I'll have to, because I have to be shorter than Anthony. But I want to tell you quickly two stories about demonstrating the love of Jesus. And it's about my father-in-law, it's about Jill's dad. The first one is about Jill and I were going out uh, for a special evening and I was all dressed up and I had a white shirt and collar and tie. But I couldn't fasten my collar because I'd lost the button off the top of my shirt. And Jill's dad, who lived with us in Clayton Lee Woods in this nice house at the time, was sat and um, 
uh, he had a little box in front of him. And what he did, he got his scissors and he cut a button off his own shirt and he sewed it on to the uh, collar of my shirt where the button was missing so that I could fasten my shirt and put my tie on and we could go out. And that was just a small demonstration of his love for me. That was one thing. The other thing is that he, he told us the story that he was one of 11 children brought up in a farming community in a, a farming house in, in Ireland. And he said that when he was little, his mum used to gather the whole family around every night before they went to bed. And she would take out the family Bible and she would read a passage to them. And then she would pray for them before they went to bed every night. And her big prayer was that one day they would all be gathered together in the throne room of heaven and that not one of her children would be lost because they would all come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and that they would be together in heaven with her. Isn't that good? And I want to tell you that that prayer has been passed down the generation and that Jill prays that prayer now. We pray that for our children, that not one of them will be lost and that one day we will all meet again in the throne room of heaven. Are you willing to share your story to demonstrate the love of Jesus? Speak the name of Jesus in a simple way that people will know. In a moment, we're going to sing a song that's probably new to you. It's called, I Speak Jesus. When this song came out, um, the person that wrote it um, just said about it, it, she said this, this song, I Speak Jesus, is all about speaking the name of Jesus. We want to speak the powerful name of Jesus over darkness, over strongholds, over fear and anxiety and over depression. We want to speak the name of Jesus, declaring peace, declaring hope, declaring healing and declaring freedom. There's power in the name of Jesus to break strongholds and to shine through the shadows. So as we sing the name of Jesus, I pray that fear would be replaced with peace and hope, that depression will be replaced with joy, that addictions will be broken, and that spiritual forces of evil will be restrained. And the song says, Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus from the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. So I pray that we wouldn't just speak the name of Jesus when we're together, but they will truly speak the name of Jesus in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our homes, and in our places of work, and that we will not be ashamed to speak the name of Jesus. When Jill was away and I cleaned out the garage, I got rid of a lot of stuff. I had journeys to the tip, and I took some stuff to the charity shop. I love the garage now. I don't mind being in there. I can find everything I have. I can even find my car. I've got my little Austin Ruby in there. I'm actually trying to sell it. It's, uh, I've got an advert now. If you're watching online, <laughs> it's for sale. And it's got one careful owner and six not very careful ones. Uh. You see, it's had seven owners. And I'm hoping to sell it so somebody else will have it. You see, the thing is, uh, it's not my car. 
and someone else will have it after me. It's only borrowed, like everything else that we have. Stuff is only borrowed. It's not ours to keep. What do we take with us when we go? Well, we don't, we, you say nothing. The only thing that we take with us are other Christians. We are called to make disciples. Speak the name of Jesus and take other people with us. But we don't do it in our strength. Jesus gives us the power. On that day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. After his ascension, Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit that we might speak boldly in his name, in his power, that others might be saved. Let's call in the lost and then there will be rejoicing in heaven, a party, a celebration. And that's what communion is. It's a party because the lost have been saved and it's celebrating that we will be together with Jesus forever. Amen. So we're going to sing now, I speak the name of Jesus. just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name
right at the beginning, so I came in fear and trembling. And I didn't know why. Because I'm not afraid of you. And I love being up front. I'm quite an extrovert, really. And I love this sort of thing. So I wondered why it was that I come in fear and trembling. I do get a bit nervous, I have to say, before a service. Uh, it wouldn't be right if I didn't. And St. Paul said that he came in fear and trembling. And I wondered why. Because he couldn't be afraid of the Corinthians. I mean, he, he didn't do things like that. And I, I didn't understand why he said that until I had my shower this morning. And it came. And I thought, wow, this is great. And I understand perfectly why. And it's not because I'm frightened of you. And it wasn't because St. Paul was frightened of the Corinthians. Because he wasn't afraid of speaking out. He was a big church leader. He was in fear and trembling about the message that he was delivering about would it be received because he didn't want anyone to be lost because he got it wrong, because he hadn't delivered it properly. He didn't want to be lost himself. He wanted it to be perfectly clear. He wanted people to understand what he was saying. And it wasn't about him, and it's not about me. And the glory wasn't his, and the glory isn't mine. And it wasn't about factions like the church at Corinth. I followed this person, and I followed that one, and I want to go this way. St. Paul was in fear and trembling in case the message was confused. You need perfectly to understand that it's about you speaking the message of Jesus because it's your story and you understand who he is for you. Do you know who Jesus is in your life? Because that's the message. It's nothing of me, it's nothing of St. Paul that can prevent you from receiving Christ. It's all about him. We're going to share communion in a moment. And the Lord said to me, you're going to hand that over to Mark because Mark is a tremendous leader. When Ever Mark leads the service, you're just looking at Jesus. There's nothing about Mark in the way he leads the service. He goes straight into it, and it's all about Jesus. And Jesus just wants Mark to lead us in communion. But what I want to say to you is, if you've got any confusion... Or if you're not sure about who Jesus is in your life, there's no rush to come and take communion. If you come and just stand at the cross and you give to Jesus anything that's bothering you, if there is anything you need to speak to Jesus about, you just come and stand at this cross and you'll remember that you won't be seen on the television. You won't be on that camera. Just come and give whatever it is that's bothering you to Jesus. Before you take communion, there's no rush. We're going to play a few songs. There's plenty of time. Time is yours. So come when you're ready. If you want some prayer, someone, we've got prayer warriors who, who we can pray with you. But you don't need that. You can come and pray with Jesus here at the cross on your own. It's just personal between you and him. And then when you're ready, you just come and take communion. Mark, 
will lead us now. And I'll get out of the way. Thank you. I uh, didn't have any words before that. I haven't got any now. But it's not about me, like Derek said. This is our God, an awesome God. A God we should fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom for us. But a God who loved us and showed it in Jesus. And what we're going to remember in communion together is what Jesus did for us. That he gave it all up. That he took our sin. That he has bought us a new righteousness. There's joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And for every one of you who has, there's joy in heaven. There's joy over you. Our Father rejoices to see you here. He's glad you've come. He welcomes you. So come, come and pray or come and take communion. Just come. That he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. And in the same way after supper he took the cup and gave thanks that this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. For the forgiveness of sins, do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you did not quit. But knowing the trials that lay ahead of you and the glory that lay beyond, you took our sin upon you. You bore death and humiliation to win for us a crown that can never fade Lord to bring us into new life to bring us back to your father and to win for us that heavenly destiny that eternity with you Lord we remember and we thank you and as we share this communion together, Lord, meet with us, I pray, for your glory. Amen. Amen. So musicians first, please, and then the folks from the back, if you'd like to come up, and then you're ready and uh, free for whatever follows. When you're ready, take communion, pray with somebody, pray on your own, the, 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 the time's for you.
to go, if you need to get uh, get a drink, pick up the children or anything, then feel free to do that. But if you want to carry on here, let's do it. If you still want to receive prayer, you just want to worship, just want to spend time. Don't rush away. Just stay. God opens his arms to you.
speak boldly your name, the name above all names, into every situation, every mountain that we face, every challenge that you present to us, because your name is the most powerful name. So thank you, Jesus. sticks of rock, Jesus written all the way through. Thank you that death could not hold you, that the veil was torn in two, that you could not be silenced, that Jesus 
this has a picture of the old things. Amen. 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 We've just about reached the end of our, of our ability. <laughs> eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, there will be refreshments in the lounge, I think. But let's be, just before we go with that, let's just say the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.